based on instrument, when is an instrument rating required? When you have weather conditions less than VFR minimums, Class A airspace, file an IFR flight plan. Cool, yeah, very good. And then uh, one other one would be special VFR at night, special. right? Yeah, very good. Uh, what would be, let's see, what are some of the, oh yeah, let's go over this. What aircraft instruments and uh, equipment do we need to operate under IFR? Uh, we need all our VFR day, and then we need uh, generator, alternator, radio, altimeter, your ball turn coordinator, clock, a attitude indicator, a rate of turn indicator, and directional gyros. Cool. Very good. Uh, what are the required tests and inspections of aircraft and equipment to be legal for IFR flight? Oh, uh, you gotta have your annual, you gotta have your VOR, you gotta have your 100 hour if it's for hire, transponder, and ELT. Make sure AD is up to date too. Very good. Talk about the VOR. What, did, what are the different types of checks and how often is it required? Oh, I think you said it was a 30 days, that right? Yeah, yeah, you already said that. So what are the different kind of checks that we have uh, to be able to- Oh, you got VOTs, you got ground-based, airborne. Cool. What, uh, what's the requirement for the, the check as far as how okay. far off it can be? Right, if it's ground-based, it's plus or minus four, and if it's airborne, plus or minus six. Okay, cool. Uh, what's the easiest check to do of all of them? Airborne. The airborne? <laughs> airborne? Yeah, airborne. <laughs> I like that check, right? The dual check. Yeah, where you, you get the to fly at least. So that's, that's true, right? Yeah, let's go fly and check this VOR, <laughs> right? Yeah, we could do that. All right, cool, very good. Let's see, oh, when we record the VOR check, what's uh, required to be logged? You gotta have your date, you gotta have the error bearing, you gotta have the uh, place where you did it, and signatures. Yep, signature, very good. Oh, here we go. Okay, so since we're on the subject of VORs, so what are the different types of uh, VOR stations that we have? Uh, we have just VORs, Vortex, VOR, DME. Anything else? Another one maybe? tech and maybe? Yeah, tech and Yeah, tech and which we really don't. <laughs> <laughs> tech and more does it. Yeah, most of them is what? Vortex now? Yeah, most of yeah them. Vortex, yeah, that's true. Yep, Vortex. Do you know the service ceilings? Or the uh, service whole area? Service volumes, uh, I guess I should say. Let's see. Now I got it tabbed out. Somewhere in all of these tabs. There you go. Yeah, VOR low was at 18,000 feet. 1,000 feet to 18,000 feet. 40 nautical miles the lower, and then 70 nautical miles, 5,000 to 8,000 feet. And then the VOR high from 1,000 to 60,000 feet. Yeah, there you go. Either one of those we can, we can use on your aircraft, yeah. right? The high ones, still the same as the low ones, um, which they're, they're starting to decommission a lot of VOR oh, stations really? now. Yeah, it's a lot of the... Uh, I wonder why. Just I think they're yourself. decluttering maybe mm -hmm. type of the thing, because I know a lot of them going off of GPS now and such. Uh, so yeah. they're just kind of like, yeah, we don't need to spend the money or the, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the maintenance required to keep these VOR stations up would be my guess. I don't know, but uh, let's see. What, what are some of the limitations of the VOR that uh, you might encounter in one of your flights? Uh, you got the cone of confusion if you get too close to it and then uh, if you get too far away from it, it won't be accurate. Yeah, so what happens when, when you're passing over? So obviously VOR uses one of our checkpoints, right? Or one of the waypoints in our flight plan. What, uh, what what are we going to start seeing as we uh, get closer to that and then eventually pass over that kind of Be a two from flag flip. Two from flag flip, yeah, yeah. Uh, do you know the service area in which the kind of confusion is kind of more prominent? Uh, is it about a mile or is it three miles? I'm not too sure. Uh, I think you're right. I think it's a mile. Let's see. What are some of the errors that we have uh, that can potentially be with this VOR as we're navigating with it? It could just be out of service. How would you know if it's out of service? You'd want to listen to Morse code. What does the Morse code tell you? If it's in service. Okay, is that the only thing? What's yeah. so so specifically Morse code? What what is it? Morse coding. The, <laughs> if I can uh, put it in that term. The identifier. Oh, the identifier. There we go. Okay, right. So why would that be important? Make sure you're on the right VOR. There you're you listening to the right one. Cool, cool. How would you know you're on the right VOR? Where would you go to find that? You can listen, or the it shows like the. Well, dots on the VOR, so you just be listening. VOR, yeah, so on, on what particular? Yeah, the frequency. Yeah, the frequency, which one and is. then what, like on the charts, right? Or the approach plates or whatever we yeah. use. Uh, yeah, cool, very good. All right, list the frequency and the uh, Morse code identifier. Yeah, very good. Uh, let's see, what's DME? Distance measuring equipment. What do we use that for? We can use that for approaches. What is DME required? I believe, is it above 24,000? Yeah, feet? yeah. Yep, navigation above 24,000 feet, which, we're not going to necessarily. <laughs> a little 152. It, yeah, right. <laughs> That's right. Do all VORs provide the DME uh, distance or the DME uh, uh, equipment? 
Uh, Information, I guess. No. Yeah. All right. So another question: What is slant range distance? And to minimize the slant error, how far from the facility should you be at what altitude? I think it's one mile for every thousand feet from. Uh, yeah. Yeah. One mile for every thousand feet. Yep. That's right. So basically, decreases or the the distance measuring uh, that you have actually becomes more accurate as you come closer to the VOR, right? Right, yeah. All right. So how many degrees of deviation does each dot represent on the indicator for the VOR? VOR is uh, two degrees, yeah. That's right. What angular deviation from the VOR course is represented by a half-scale deflection of the CDI? That'd be five. Five degrees, yeah, very good. Excellent. Let's see. Cool, all right. I think we hammered those VORs to death. <laughs> <laughs> Should be good. Cool, all right, let's talk about GPS. How does GPS work? Uh, it uses 24 different satellites around the, orbiting around the world. And uh, gives you your longitude, latitude, altitude. How many, how many satellites do you need to determine a 3D position? Uh, four. Four, very good, yep. How about for rain? I need five. Five, right, yeah. Can you operate without rain? Yes. Yeah, you can operate, yeah. What is rain? A receiver, autonomous, integrity monitor. There you go. Cool, very good, awesome. More of a fan of WASP. But... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What's WAS now that you mentioned? Uh, wide area augmented. System. There you go. Cool. What, what does it do? What's its purpose? More accurate than RAM. Yeah, it enhances also... the GPS integrity, right? Yeah. yeah. What are the requirements for using GPS under IFR? Uh, you got to make sure it's up to date. I believe it's every 28 days. You have to update it. And uh, How do you update it? Uh, you can go, I think it's, I've seen one of my instructors do it before. It's like a little plug in. You take the chip out of the GPS. And, oh, okay. Yeah. So it's yeah. a digital update, right? Yeah. yeah. Cool. You update the chip. And you are be good to go on that. Let's see. How do you verify you have RAIM or WAS capability in flight? It really just depends on the kind of GPS you have. And you can also, we'll show you if there's any expected outages along your route. Mm -hmm. Is there anybody you can call in route to verify? Flight service station. There you go. Cool. Very good. Let's see. Cool. All right. So we talked about in route, navigation, VOR, GPS. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. So that's basically what we got. We got the GPS. We got uh, the VOR for the in-route portions of the flight. And then as we start approaches into uh, the airports, we can still use approach uh, you know, with VOR and GPS as well. But then as we get, oh, I'm sorry, arrival. And then as we get into approaches, uh, what's one of the main forms of approaches into an airport? Like uh, just a kind of approach? Or? Yeah, a kind of approach, yeah. Well, we have ILS. Yeah, ILS, cool, yeah. So what particular is, uh, what are the co particular components about the ILS that we have? Uh, there's a localizer, glide slope, marker beacons, and uh, approach lighting systems. Cool, how do we uh, identify that? Uh, we'll put the localizer frequency into our uh, comm box, mm -hmm. and then, not the comm box, the navigation, or the, where you put the VOR frequencies, and then you would tune an idea there. Yeah. Cool, very good. How, how do you know, uh, are there any indicators as far as distance is concerned on the ILS as to how far out you are? Not quite sure, but I think it's 10 nautical miles you start picking up, light slope or localizer. All right, how about, how about like as you get closer, are there any indications? Uh, marker beacons. Marker beacons, there you go. Outer in there. Cool. And then you could also use uh, what else to tell the distance? Is it DME? DME, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's, it's, yeah. They got that equipped, right? Very good. A lot of times you can overlay that with a, a GPS fixes as well, and that'll help like yeah. supplement the yeah, distance, yeah, right? But yeah, very good. Let's see. Oh yeah, so kind of along that same line, what are the substitutes for the ILS outer marker? Let's see, we, we already talked about so, several of them. Like you got the DME, you got the GPS. You ever heard of a PAR or ASR, Precision Approach Radar, and Airport Surveillance Surveillance Radar? No, I those type of approaches. Okay. The, the they're they're really uh, what ATC air traffic control services can provide you for a particular type of approach, right? So if you have a precision approach radar, uh, basically air traffic control can give you uh, both lateral and vertical guidance. Okay. Uh, and then you got airport surveillance radar, which uh, gives you just the lateral guidance, but then altitude uh, suggestions uh, as you uh, descend toward the runway. So basically, it's huh. a controller here telling you a you know left five degrees or right five degrees or whatever the case may be or uh even down to precision where they tell you start turn stop turn type <laughs> of thing right yeah. so it's very there's there's a few of them like nearby like lawton i know lawton oklahoma has one of those i think the asr going in there uh, i've never approached i've never used it there but anyway just a different type of approach that you can uh, that you can use it's your favorite kind of approach 
My favorite kind? Yeah. Uh, I love the ILSs, man. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I I think they're pretty stinking awesome because they're old school. They work just as good as they did a long time ago. <laughs> and, and I mean, there's just no mistaking, man. You get those needles right on the center. It's pretty cool. Yeah, that's a great question, man. Mm -hmm. Ooh, what kind of errors are the ILS subject to? Uh, false horizon, or not false horizon, false glide slope. Yeah, there you go. And then uh, there's like buildings in the way can interrupt the connection between the plane and the yeah. localizer. Yeah. Yep. Ooh, what's a SDF? SDF? Mm hmm Not quite sure. Simplified Directional Facility. Okay. Yeah, so it provides a lateral guidance similar to the localizer, but less accurate because the course is fixed to either 6 or 12 degrees. Okay. So it's similar to that of a localizer, but it's just a little bit different. It's limited in its capabilities. There's no vertical guidance on that one. There's an LDA, you heard of the localizer type directional aid. Yeah, so that one's a little more precise than the F SDF. Just like a localizer, an, an LDA or the, the localizer type directional aid may also provide a glide slope for vertical guidance in some instances. And these are they're published as an LDA glide slope and are characterized as approach and vertical guidance as well. Uh, oftentimes you'll, you'll see something like that when you're you're coming up to an airport that doesn't have a, uh, an approach exactly lined up with the runway. It's a little bit off. Uh, and yeah. so you can have that type of thing. Uh, usually the minimums are a little bit higher. The uh, Yeah, the LDA is not aligned with the runway. Uh, and upon arriving at the MBA, the DA, the pilot will have to maneuver the aircraft to position to make a normal landing. Let's see. How far off is it usually? It's uh, within, let's see, it usually has, the alignment is within 30 degrees of the runway center line. Oh, okay. So uh, it, it may be offset a little bit, but it'll be within that 30 degrees of the center line in order for the approach to be listed as that. And I, a lot of times you'll see that in uh, like if you got like some obstacles or terrain or something where a, a, a straight off localizer course or glides, um, ILS would not be uh, available for that. But huh. anyway. all right. So we talked a little bit about uh, the ILS, VOR stuff. Well, let's talk a little bit about preparing for the flight, right? So what can we expect on a, uh, in order to operate as VFR, not as far as equipment, but uh, let's talk about currency first. So what's required for you to be current to operate under an IFR flight plan? Uh, you're gonna have 66 hits on the six, past six months. You gotta have six approaches, holding procedures, intercepting and tracking courses. Cool, very good. Um, how would you how would you accomplish that? What, what are some of the ways that you can accomplish it? Uh, you can either do it in a plane or in a proof simulator. Okay, cool. If you do it in a plane, what, what do you have to do? You gotta have a safety pilot. Safety pilot, do you have to have a safety pilot? If you're not in IFR, if you're in BFR okay. conditions. If uh, if you do have your instrument rating, can you go up and just shoot those approaches as is yeah, and count can. those? Yeah. yeah, yeah, you can do that, right? <laughs> like, yeah, you bet it. Better than asking somebody, hey, you want to come up here with me? That's right, yeah. right? Yeah, maybe save a little money or a lunch or something. Hey, we come with me, I'll buy you lunch, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So as, as an IFR pilot, you're always looking for those uh, instrument approaches so you can log them off, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> Sign them off. Very good. Do you know what the requirement is in order to be able to log an instrument approach? Oh, uh, you have to, from every segment, so initial and then intermediate and final approach, and then all the way to minimums. Do you have to go to minimums? Maybe if you're not in visual, or if you are visual, you wouldn't have to. Okay, so visual meaning like with the foggles? Yeah. Yeah, okay, so right. So if, if we decide to take a safety pilot, we got foggles on, we gotta fly the instrument approach down to minimums with the foggles on, right? What if you're an actual IMC? So you just wouldn't have to go all the way to minimums? Over. Right, yeah, okay. yeah. Basically what it is is um, as long as you pass the final approach fix still an IMC, then you you can log, log the approach, okay. right? So it's pass after final approach fix. And I'm not sure the wording on that, but I do know that uh, you know as long as you remain an IMC pass the final approach fix, then you can log that. that particular type of uh, approach. Uh, what if what if you were on the intermediate portion of the approach and you're EMC, but then after the final approach fix, you pass through IMC? Can does that count as well? Yeah, I would say that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, because you can't see the runway. Yeah. You can't see the runway. You're like, oh, it's the clouds. Here we go. And I've I've actually shot many approaches like that where you're actually above the cloud, a very thin cloud layer. You're above the cloud layer, and then you descend into the clouds through, and then down, and you break out, and there's a runway. Yeah. So yeah, definitely, that's uh, that couch counts as an approach. Yeah, log that sucker up, right? <laughs> uh, same goes for logging IMC too, right? Um, so what, what do you need to log IMC? Solely based by reference. Solely by reference to instruments. That's exactly right. Yeah. I have the uh, either safety pod there, or if you're actually flying it in uh, the actual uh, IMC conditions. Absolutely. What is the minimum visibility needed to take off? Right for. And there's none in part 91, which we are, but uh, it's recommended to use like the uh, minimums of the approach. So okay. at least the clouds be that high. Yeah, there. good, very good. 
Excellent. Have you, have you actually ever done an IFR takeoff? I have not. Okay. So uh, see, next time you fly with your instructor, see if you can do this. Just have them, just when you line up with the runway, just pull the foggles on. And uh, all you do is just maintain center line with that heading indicator, yeah, right? Okay. Just don't let it drift left or right. And then you can just take take right off huh. and uh, fly. That's good. That's if you're a, uh, that. We had a, an examiner who, who would do that periodically. I would run it through with my students and be like, all right. <laughs> fog up and they'd be like can we do this like absolutely so yeah and it actually works too as, as the instructor uh when you become an instructor you'll see they don't deviate much from the uh the center line even if they do a little bit you can you're right there on the rudder pedals to help yeah. steer back but realistically you watch them i mean if they're, if they're focused on that head in indicator then they, they yeah they, they maintain straight course pretty much it's uh, not bad at all very good Let's talk about departure procedures. All right, what are the different types of departure procedures we have? Uh, you got ODPs and you have SIDs. Good, all right, what's the difference? I believe it's only one is graphically and one is both graphically and textually. Yeah, there you go, right? Uh, you could have, well, let me, let me ask you this. What, what's the purpose of an ODP or what, what is an ODP and what's the purpose of it? Uh, just obstacle departure clearance mm -hmm. or procedure. Yeah. So you don't want to hit something at the end of the runway if you can't see it, you're an IMC. Yeah, so. exactly right. So to, de to develop a uh, safe departure from a particular airport, they develop these obstacle departure procedures, right? Which, all right. Uh, do all airports have them? No, know. they don't, right? Yeah, it's all based on where they are and uh, what type of airport and stuff. And Maybe like a flat area and there's no obstacles anywhere. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> I take off and go wherever I want, right? <laughs> yeah, not all of them have it. Very good. Excellent. Let's see. Oh, yes. Because actually we use JEP charts too, and the JEP charts actually have the ODPs listed with the airport information. And I don't think that's true with the FAA. I think that it's only a Jeppesen thing. Cool, all right. Do you also find the uh, approach plates and instrument departure procedures in the TPPs? I just kind of go on a four flight and look at <laughs> approaches. <laughs> Where's my departure tab, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. All right, I'll, I'll let that one go too, because I can't remember honestly where they're found. I don't think they're in the TPPs, honestly. Yeah. I think they're, they might be, I don't remember now. I don't remember there. I just know I'd pull it up in my JEP charts and there it is. It's like, yes, all right, I'm good. See, so yeah, I told you I haven't done this in a while. Oh my gosh, all right. Let's see. Do you know what criteria determines uh, that you will remain clear of the obstacles when flying the ODP? I believe it's 200 feet climb gradient and then you cross the end of the runway at least 35 feet AGL. There, you, Yeah, okay. Yep, uh, 200 feet, yeah, foot per minute climb, right? Yeah, there you go, very good. Then uh, then you got to make your first turn no earlier than 400 feet AGL and maintaining that 200 foot per minute climb. Yeah, very good. Who's responsible for the ODP? Pilot. The pilot is, yeah, that's right. Uh, so in, in what scenario would that ODP work? Like for example, if we were to go to a class Delta airport and that is actually in operation at the time of our departure, would we be required to follow the ODP? We wouldn't have to. Yeah, you wouldn't have to, right? Who's responsible then? ATC. Air traffic control, yeah, that's exactly right. So it's more for like uh, non-controlled airports where you're hoping to depart IFR, but they, uh, <clears throat> where, where does controlled airspace happen in, at a non-tower airport 700 yeah 700 feet right so they can't guarantee you clearance so you're about right that. yeah until you're actually in their controlled airspace uh, right so that's why you follow that odp right yeah, as, yeah. as you depart <clears throat> and then you check in with departure and say hey here's where i am here's my altitude whatever so yeah very good and let's see Ooh, how would you know if an odp has been published for your airport i uh, just pretty much just you just look it up and they yeah, you can look it up. Uh, is there another way? Say, let's say you are going from here to a particular airport, say, I don't know, Corsicana, and you go into Corsicana and you want to depart there an hour later, maybe you're just going to get gas or something like that. Uh, is there something on a particular chart that you can view to see that, oh yeah, I got to make sure I... You could look at the departures, yeah. departure procedures. Yeah, okay. How about on an instrument approach procedure, would it be listed? The uh, non-standard takeoff. Minimums and is that kind of what you're getting at? Okay. Uh, how about an indication on an approach plate, maybe? Yeah, like the T or. The ah, plate. there we go. Yeah, there you go. You're gonna have the uh, T symbol that denotes you're gonna have a ODP, right? Means the takeoff minimums are not standard. Yeah, that's exactly what you were referring to. Yeah. Let's see. It's kind of funny. Like, why would you put it on an approach, approach plate? procedure? Right? <laughs> it's kind of too late. By the yeah, time. I know. Well, it's, yeah, you would think it's that, but it's it's also a good reminder. Just hey, as an instrument pilots, we got to check everything, right, yeah. and make sure we verify. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So, oh, here we go. How can you determine if your aircraft will be able to meet the required climb gradient? I uh, was just looking at your POH. Yeah. Uh, performance data. There you go. 
performance data. Where would the climb gradients required be published? It usually says in the departure procedures. Yeah, right? there you go. Yeah, so 400, 300, 200. Okay, what is that in reference to though? Nautical miles. Ah, feet per nautical miles. So you have to do a little conversion there, right? Yeah, yeah. What do we convert it to? Is it ground speed? Something? Yeah, use ground speed uh, to determine the foot per minute climb, right? Because right. we read foot per minute. Foot, right. yeah, to, yeah, yeah, foot right. per nautical mile, yep. So you gotta do a little conversion there. Very good. Let's talk about a VCOA. Do you know what that is? Visual climb over the airport. Yeah, what, what, what is that? Uh, when would we use that? Like if we have to climb to a certain altitude at our first waypoint or... And we can't just like straight up do it, so we'll have to circle around the airport to get that altitude. Yeah, there you go, right? So make sure if you can't, I think it has to be done BMC, right? Yeah. So uh, if, you, if you're not able to maintain a certain climb gradient and it is BMC conditions to a certain point, you can do that visual climb over airport to get up. Okay, is it kind of like just doing traffic pattern? Yeah, that's basically, it's like holding over the airport as you climb. Yeah, okay. Yep. Gotcha. Yep, let's see. Okay, so then we move on from the ODP, we go to the instrument departures. What's the purpose of it? S SID or standard instrument departure. It uh, makes ATC and the pilot not have to work as hard, reduces workload. And uh, yeah, basically, yeah, yeah it, it streamlines the departure at a particular airport, right? It, it, it provides a way to uh, smoothly flow from the airport environment to our in route segment, right? Yeah. Where we go, uh, we perform this particular instrument departure. A lot of times, especially in our smaller aircraft, uh, the instrument departure uh, is followed for altitude, but for waypoints. Right, uh, the altitudes are, especially around the DFW area, a lot of them are built towards the uh, commercial airlines, right? It'd be <laughs> yeah. above 10,000 feet at this point and you know, kind of climb out. So whatever the case may be, but uh, we can use a lot of those similar departures uh, for our altitude, but usually just the waypoints and kind of maintain your particular altitude. Oh, kind of based on that note, going back to getting our clearance, uh, our departure clearance uh, for an IFR flight plan, what can you expect to hear uh, once you filed your IFR clearance, uh, what do you expect here from AT air traffic control? Uh, your clearance limit, your route, your altitudes, departure frequency, and transponder code. Right. Yeah, very good. If the clearance does not clear you to the partic a particular airport or your destination, it only clears you to a fix, are you cleared to go beyond that fix at that point yeah. in time? No. Yeah, that's right. So you either gotta get a new clearance. Cle yeah, yeah. Qu hey, can I clear? Go ahead. Or you gotta enter a hold or something, right? Yeah. Like, I'm not allowed to go beyond this. <laughs> Sitting out there holding. Do 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 do. Hello. They don't do that. Very rare that I hear people just cleared. I, I have heard it though. Like certain aircraft have been cleared to a certain point and not beyond that, yeah. uh, and it was due to certain restrictions or whatever, whatever route they filed or whatever. But I've heard it once or twice, but usually it's just yeah, you're clear to this airport. airport. Yeah. yeah. As you filed. What did they do after they did that? Just cleared to the fix? Uh, right? Yeah, it was just the initial clearance on the ground. Uh, and then once they got in the air, the person say, oh yeah, you're cleared to the airport uh, or whatever. Okay. So we were talking about the SIDs and how they they can be depicted uh, textually and or graphically, right. right? Are they always, which one is, is of higher priority? Which does it have to be? The least textual. The least textual, that's right. So can ATC issue you a departure procedure without you having the graphic to back it up? Yeah, if yeah. You have at least just the textual. Yeah, absolutely. They they give it to you verbally, right? And you yeah. write it down. There's my textual name, right? <laughs> Here, fly to this, fly to this, fly to maintain this altitude, right? Yeah. So all of that. Yeah, very good. Cool. Where do we find the SIDs? Those will be in the terminal publication. Yeah, very good.